thank you everyone very much for coming. Um, this is the first event in Melbourne for Startup Grown. So yeah, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, give you a nice idea. Startup Grown is going to be an inner conversation between me and Brent tonight. And the um, main thing is based on the platform from the US, so they just invite you know, successful startups to come along and chat. And so we can just kind of hear their story. Uh, get you know, get some learning out of it. Hear how they raise capital. Hear how they build an audience. All the kind of things that we're looking to do with our own businesses to help take to the next level. So, uh, like everyone, to give a big round of applause for Brent. For All right. So, thanks for having me. And uh, so, yeah, look, um, I, read, I reached out to Brent because. Uh, when the US asked me to, to kind of put this event on, he, they said, look, I want you to try and, um, if you can, list the top 10 of best startups there are in Melbourne, and I want you to start approaching them. And uh, Swift was one of those startups, and I reached out to Brent straight away, and uh, yeah, it was just fantastic. He said, yeah, look, I'd love to come, love to help everyone, and that's how we kind of started, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't feel like anything that you can do within a startup that can help other startups, you know, absolutely jump on board and do it. So, can, like, uh, I want to get back a fair bit here. I want to, uh, you know, wind the clock a little bit. Wind the clock a little bit. So, I guess, what was your education? And what, what, is, what you know, let, let's see the journey. Um, or even the even the jobs you have for the startups, the failures, everything else. Yeah, there's plenty of failures. Okay. That, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, Melbourne, born and raised, um, grew up in uh, Brighton, went to Brighton Grammar School and basically, you know, school wasn't a, a, a massive thing for me. Um, I loved uh, being there with my friends, but I didn't really get a lot of uh, inspiration or enthusiasm about the classes that I was going to. You know, I liked my maths, I liked my science, that was about it. You know, I didn't really feel like I was getting a huge amount out of it. Um, loved my technology, loved my computers and got to the point where I mean, back when I was in school, we didn't have computers in every class. We had one computer room, and we had some IBM 386s in there, if you want to remember those. Um, and, uh, you know, it got to the point where I was, I was really enjoying my technology, and every time we'd have an IT class, or later on in school, when we were getting taught for, uh, you know, pre-university. You guys sit here right in the back? Yeah. 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 With the mic or without? With? With? All right, fantastic. Um, so basically got to the point during school where um, I worked out that I, I knew a little bit more about computing than the teachers that were teaching it. So I started taking after class, after school classes with the teachers, teaching them how to teach us computers. Nice. And so this, uh, this was good for me during school, so I, I kind of aced that class. Um, but otherwise school really wasn't that much for me. And to the point of I almost dropped out during year 12 just because I couldn't really see the point. It's kind of like when you're, when you're working a job and you're, you're just kind of doing the, the nine to five and you don't really see the point, it's really hard to get enthused and I couldn't see the point in doing it. Now in saying that, you know, I'm really glad that I did finish school and you know, I didn't get amazing results but didn't get bad results as well. well um, <laughs> and managed to get into computer science at, um, I think it might have been at Monash. Now I ended up deferring it because I, I couldn't really justify sitting through a six year course, I think it was. Um, this was back in uh, the year 2000 when I finished school. Uh, doing a six year computer course of uh, in an industry which was changing so rapidly, I just couldn't justify it. So I said, look, I'm gonna defer it for a year, just see what I wanna do. And basically I, I went up to the snow and then fell in love with the snow. Started working bar, working uh, every hospitality job that, that, that got anything which I could do just to make a couple of bucks. And then ended up following the winters around the world. And uh, I was a snowball, essentially. I didn't turn on a computer for years. I uh, just went from mountain to mountain, country to country, uh, teaching snowboarding, working behind bars, and basically doing what I loved. And I absolutely loved doing that. So that for me was all I needed for a long, long time. So it was a pretty good gig. Absolutely. You know, between the, uh, between the winters as well, ducking off to some other countries, lived in Cape Town for a couple of months. Um, all across Europe, all around uh, different parts of Africa. It was just absolutely spectacular. And then it got to the point, I was like, well, I'm either going to do this for the rest of my life and turn into one of those 60-year-old snow bombs who hasn't had any of the real-world experience outside of the snow, um, 
or I can come back and do something that, that I really enjoy. So um, I was probably about 22 at this stage and came back to Melbourne and uh, started working for R again because that's what I knew and that's what I loved and I loved getting out there and meeting people and getting paid essentially just to give people a good experience. Um, and then I opened up a bar. I thought, fantastic, I really enjoy doing this, but I get quite frustrated when I'm doing something and someone's asking me to do something and it's time to become the boss. Yeah, it, it really was. First time it was, it was, it was you know, the frustration about certain things were just going too far and so let's open up the place. Now when I when I decided to open up the bar, I was really kind of headstrong about being independent. You know, I want to do this myself, I want this to be my bar, make it my way, do what I want to do. And uh, and so basically I just shut off the rest of the world. Not literally, I didn't lock myself in a room. Pretty hard to open a bar when you're locked in a room. But um, I just sort of stopped uh, listening to ideas and uh, some feedback from, from those which were close to me. You know, people would come up to me and say, oh, you know what you should try? Oh, maybe you should do this. Oh, how about trying this? And I was just, I was so headstrong about being independent, but I was almost scared about the business succeeding because of somebody else's idea. Like how, how crazy is that? You want your business to succeed, make some money, do it right. But I was really scared. I, was, I really wanted it to be because of me. Now, that business lasted for about three years, didn't work, ended up losing a lot of money, and it was all on me. And you know, I could have, you know, maybe made it work with some of those ideas and some of the feedback from uh, from some of those that were close to me. But um, you know, this is all part of that that learning experience which I had. I, I consider that to be my university degree because it was a, an absolute. It was, it was really, really tough for so, so long. I was doing seven hours, sorry, seven hours, that, that would be bad for a week. I was doing seven days a week. We were doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then bar afterwards. We were just really, really busy when we started up, and then when it started to slow down, it was harder because you're, you're there more and more, trying not to you know, lose more money on staff, and trying to cut costs here, and cut costs there, and do all of that. And, uh, and that, was, that was a really tough experience, but I really appreciate it. You know, it was spectacular. Um, you know, I lost a lot of money doing it, but that was fine. So I got out of that and, um, and then decided, you know, let's go back to what I know. Go back to just bartending, started working at some nightclubs across Melbourne, uh, a few bars, just sort of going back to the basics, going back to, to what I knew, what I liked. And after three years or three and a half years of just stress and hard work and grinding and you know, doing what you do with, with any startup, uh, going back to just a, a medial bar job was absolutely spectacular. So it's kind of almost reminds me of like, you know, that, that uh, e-myth scenario where you're the technician or the hairdresser or whatever, and then you said, look, you know, stuff this, why am I doing it for this kind of money? I'm going to have over my own hairdresser shop, but then you tend to have the mindset of the technician. Yeah. And it sounds like that's what you were. Absolutely. Like. And for anyone that's read the e-myth, which a lot of you probably have, I read this after opening the bar, and I was reading it like it, it was my story. It was um, it was uncanny how, how close to home it was. Um, and I, you know, that book is fantastic. I still give it to some of my staff members today who are, you know, trying to trying to do their own thing and it's it's a fantastic book. But yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Sorry, I mean cut you off. It's just cause yeah, I I know like some of my own failures are the same thing as well, as like kind of like you saying that you know had 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 your blinkers on and you didn't want to you know you're going to succeed or fail on your own terms I guess yeah I didn't, we didn't want to get any input from anyone and then that was kind of in the end yeah you know, what killed it for you yeah well it was yeah and then was. you were happy to go back to the, you know the technician role and so if they went back to the club scene there yeah um, and that was fun you know but uh, after three or four months you know I, I had my taste in a, a real sort of business environment albeit you know a small cafe bar. Um, and I couldn't go back to, to working for the man. I absolutely loved uh, working for myself and putting it all on the line and giving it a go and trying something. And so then I, I went back and started to feed my, my technological uh, passions and started up a business called Tech Relief. Uh, it looks good on paper, the name, really hard to say over the phone. Tech Release, Tech, you know, really, really hard. So. Um, that's, that's definitely a tip with your startup. Make it easy to understand over the phone because otherwise you'll end up spelling out every day. Um, but uh, Startup Tech Relief, what we did then was a, uh, we were basically a, a technology consulting company. And that's quite broad because we didn't really know what we were going to do. We just, uh, I keep on saying we, it was just me. And uh, at, at the end there were a couple more, but I didn't know what I wanted it to do. I just knew that I loved technology and I wanted to get paid for working with computers. 
So I started going out, putting out some flyers saying, tech relief, need some help with your computers, need uh, some assistance with your technology, whatever it might be, and started to get some, uh, some initial customers, people saying, I've lost my email icon. It's like, oh, okay, it's gonna be a tough one. Um, yeah, I reckon I can help. Um, and then, so that kind of went from there, and it started off, for probably the first six months, only residential customers, people just, internet problems or, or setting up new computers or um, you know trying to work out how to do certain things with Word or whatever else. And then it started to get a little bit more complicated as people got you know some good customer service from me. They'd start to tell their friends who worked in businesses and then those businesses would start to call us up and say, hey, we've got um, you know, an email server problem. It's like, all right, fantastic. You know, what type of server is it? Okay, it's an ex exchange server. Fantastic, yep, we can fix those. No worries, I'll be there tomorrow at four o'clock. Fantastic, jump so on we, Google, we, what so is an exchange server? Were you kind of learning through the process? Absolutely. Because I know like, Absolutely. oh yeah, I can't do that. I'm going to check it out on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it, I'll be, I'll be there, I'll fix it up. That's absolutely what I did. And uh, I had no experience with exchange servers. I had no experience with any servers or anything beyond what you would normally have from your laptop. And so I'd go out there and sometimes, you know, you'd stay up 12 hours past your bedtime and, uh, by the next morning, you're an expert in exchange services, and you'd get there, and it was actually just their email icon had disappeared. <laughs> but um, so I gained a lot of experience and a lot of understanding and, and knowledge, and, and it was basically educating myself by clients asking me things. Um, that was fantastic. I had a lot of fun with uh, Tech Relief. I had a couple of technicians after about 18 months, and basically just got them to do what I was doing, and I was starting to form the business into something which was not just financially viable for myself, but um, something which could scale. And so I really didn't want the business to be reliant on, on me, my skills, uh, my customer service, but on the business itself. And so I got a couple of these technicians in, that started to work really well, and then I just sort of found, you know what, I'm, I'm not really passionate about this. I'm not passionate about climbing under people's desks every day, trying to plug in their USB because it fell out. Or, um, you know, constantly just getting the same questions. It was, it was a little bit repetitive and it wasn't something that I really wanted to be doing long term. And, uh, and I suppose that's really where, where the start of the Swift story comes into play. We, um, uh, once again, we, I, I was um, uh, living with a, a friend of mine who's a comedian, who's now uh, you know, trying to make his way in LA and he's, he's sort of an up and coming comedian, which is fantastic. Living with him in one of the best apartments um, in Melbourne. I say best not in terms of, you know, it was a penthouse apartment and had a spa and a gym and everything else. It didn't. Uh, it was the best apartment because it was just so much fun. It was the bachelor pad, uh, you know, that you'd see on TV or something. It was absolutely spectacular. So I was working tech relief at the time and my comedian housemate was doing gigs at night for an hour or two hours. And so during the day, he wasn't doing much. And once I had a couple of technicians for Tech Relief, I really wasn't doing much during the day either. So we were playing a lot of uh, Guitar Hero. We were just doing a lot of nothing. A lot of partying, which was good fun. Um, and then one morning after a fairly large night, we were quite hungover on the couch and uh, we wanted some pizza. It was as simple as that. And we were arguing. And, and normally we would sort out, sort out our things with paper, rock, scissors, because that's, that's how you get things done around our apartment. But um, we, uh, we were arguing, arguing over who was going to place the order for the pizza. Because when you're hungover, it's like you don't even want to make a phone call. Right? Yeah, definitely. Like, it was exhausting. And I was like, look, I'll just jump on my computer. I'll find out if we can order some online. That'll be fantastic. And uh, couldn't find anything. You know, from all of my experience in tech relief and, and uh, passion for, for startups and everything else, could not find anything which I could, not even just pizza. Like, we got to a point where it was like, I don't, I don't care what it is. You know, if it's a salad, send it over. And uh, we couldn't find anything. So he was like, well, why don't you do that? Why don't you make it? I said, well, actually, yeah, I will. I will. And uh, so we ended up you know, calling the pizza and that was fine. Um, and then that's really how Zwift started. And so for the next six months, we continued working with Tech Relief and uh, was just basically putting together the puzzle piece, you know, the pieces of the puzzle, so that I could create a business which was uh, globally viable um, and something which was uh, able to, to scale and to keep myself interested as well. Yeah. Um, and it was funny, back when I was, I was starting up the bar, as I was saying, you know, I was very closed off. I didn't really want to 
open up uh, you know the floor to opinions and ideas with uh, with anyone. And I just completely flipped the polar opposite with that when I was starting up Swift. I was asking everyone I knew and people I didn't know as well. You know, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. Um, give me some feedback. Give me some criticism. Tell me what you don't think is going to work about it. Tell me what you don't like. I guess everyone kind of feels like they're an expert when it comes to ordering pizza or like a service, you know, something that they've ordered, had to order over the phone and what service they've got. They can, yeah. you know, chip in, give you like some, something's going to help, you know. To your, to your product. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the day, pretty much everyone is a potential customer for us. Um, so, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, Zwift is a comprehensive online solution for independent restaurants. We make websites and online ordering systems for restaurants. And we take all of the, the legwork out of the way. We make sure it's, it's very, very easy to use from the restaurant's point of view, very intuitive, and very easy to use from a consumer's point of view as Does well. Does anybody use Zwift? Until they're here tonight? Yeah. 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 Okay, fantastic. So I mean that's that's part of our business model as well. We don't we don't get out there and put Swift front and centre. No no look, I, 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 look, when I have to kind of find out who these ten top the top ten top ten best startups easy for me to say. And I came across across Swift and then I checked the URL and did my homework and then I'm like, oh I've used that before, you know? Right. I didn't even know but he's with the Elwood is he break the Elwood. Right. And I was saying to someone earlier this evening, I was like, man, I was like, there's no way I'd ever thought I'd be that lazy that I wanted, didn't want to call. But just playing around with that app, and I'm, like, I'm not trying to plug it at all, but it was like, <laughs> I, like well, it's in there, it's like, oh yeah, I get Ben and Jerry's ice cream as well, you can tip, yeah, tip the driver, okay. Yeah, it was yeah, like, it was, I was like, yeah, that's, man, that's cool, yeah, I wanted to you know, come along. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, no, that's good. Thank you, Elwood.com today. So, <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll get back into the, to more of the model of Zwift in a little bit, but just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page about what it is that Zwift did. Um, so then I, I had a model, and I basically spent six months putting together an investor's prospectus and all of the projected financials. This was a huge six months of work trying to put this together because I really wanted to make sure that the model could work under any circumstances. So where did you get the advice right there to like? Put all the work in and try and so somebody told you to try and look at going to a venture capital sort of from the start. No, or, not at all. So I, I didn't know at the time about venture capitalists. You know, my previous business, you you go to open a bar, you go and get a loan to do it. You don't yeah, yeah. you don't go to a VC. Um, so I was just doing what I knew, and what I knew was that if I was going to go out and get some investors who wanted to spend some of their good hard-earned money, that there would have to be a model behind it to support it. Yeah. And uh, and so throughout this process, you know, I asked a lot of people that had experience in, in uh, business plan writing, in uh, financials, and everything else. Um, but basically, just went and nutted it out. Just opened up an Excel spreadsheet and just started pumping in some numbers, working out some different variables, and working out um, you know worst case scenarios and break even points. And uh, did you have a business plan with the bar? I did actually. You did? Yeah, yeah. I did. <laughs> Go, looking back on it now, it's a little embarrassing, but you know, it absolutely was. Okay, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and that was a that was a real eye opener, actually. Having a, having a really good business plan can sort of take something from an idea to to reality before the risk is involved. And do you keep your business plan somewhat flexible? Like, do you refer to it? Because I know there's a lot of people that create a business plan and then you never see it again. You know, until, you know, you don't. It's well, yeah, that's that's it. And then, you know, people say you should always keep your business plans up to date and relevant. Um, what I've done from that, that initial business plan, you know, we've pivoted a couple of times throughout our business. Um, and so that is kind of really irrelevant to what it currently is now. And we don't have something where you can go, oh, show me the business plan of Swift for 2012. Yeah, and here you go. Um, but what we do do is, is keep things uh, under procedures. Procedures are an absolute godsend. You know, it, it seems simple, but making sure that absolutely everything can be followed by a procedure is spectacular because then instead of all of your staff or clients or everyone uh, coming up to you for with questions, they're just referring to the procedure. So this so is kind of e myth learning right there. Definitely, 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 absolutely. So that's that's where I got it from. If you're not familiar with it, the book is called e myth. You know, I think like my brother was in entrepreneurship, whatever. That was like the recommend reading you just have to read this thing and uh, yeah you know I don't like reading much myself so I just get the audio book it doesn't make any sense until you live the experience well that's I true read, I read the yeah. before I started the business and it didn't hit me how good the book was until you know until I, I think that that's true I mean a lot of people like I, I didn't really get much out of it until I uh, 
you know, had a few failures myself too. But definitely, the principles are there if you, if you can kind of, I guess, adhere to them. Um, whether you've had the learning or not, I, I definitely recommend having having a read, or if you're like me, getting the audio book. But um, it's basically if it, it's all worked on the franchise model like McDonald's. It's kind of kind of like saying that if you, if you can put everything into documentation and procedures that a 15 year old can follow, and you know, and run a multi million dollar business, then uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it's about. So yeah. sorry. No, no, that that's absolutely what I was talking about. That's great. Um, so yeah, in terms of the business plan, uh, you know, we, we don't have an active business plan, but we've got operations manuals, we've got, for all of our different departments, we've got procedures set up for all different scenarios and everything else. And that's not to say that everything has to stick to the scenario, to the, or to the procedure, to the T, um, but it's, it's a really good guide. Um, you know, we, we still really appreciate the fact that we're a very malleable company. Um, we're constantly evolving, constantly changing everything that we're doing. We're constantly uh, trying to make it better, more efficient, uh, more financially viable. So uh, definitely the procedures are not set in stone, that's for sure. Um, so going back to, where were we? Uh, setting up the business, doing the projected financials. Um, and then it was just basically, once I had something that I was, I was confident with, and I thought, you know, if that, that investor's prospectus and business plan was a business, it would work. And uh, so then all I needed to go out was go out and just get some money for it. So that seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, but not that easy, <laughs> not that easy right? Definitely not that easy. So um, basically I, I went out to everyone that I knew, my friends, and I was like, look, if you want to throw in a thousand dollars, I'll take it. I'll give you, I'll give you some shares. If, uh, if your parents want to invest, fantastic. I went up to all of the businesses which I had through Tech Relief and pitched all of them. Um, through my, my family and my family friends, pitched them all, basically door knocked. Yes. How much money were you asking for? Uh, initially, we were after a quarter of a million. So that's all we needed just to get the ball rolling and to, to get the thing off the ground, to get the initial minimum viable product um, going and to, to be able to get out there in the real world and start to get some traction. Um, and so that, that was a, a you know quite an ambitious task for, for me considering I had no idea what I was doing when I was going out to do it. I just had something that I was proud of and something that I was confident that was going to work and uh, managed to raise almost all of that. So definitely not all of it started uh, when we started off, but it was enough to, to get the, the ball rolling, to start hiring some staff, hiring some developers, um, and start the, the model actually working. Um, now back when I had the bar, just to give you a little bit of a backstory again, next door to us was a, uh, a pizza restaurant called Pedro's Pit Pizza Restaurant, pedrospit.com.au. Um, and uh, every now and then, if we were having a quiet night, uh, they'd come in and they'd be like, oh, Frank, can you do a couple of deliveries for us? It's like, yeah, you know, happy to help out you know, wherever I can, go and deliver some pizzas and come back, serve some drinks, deliver some pizzas, come back, serve some drinks. I'm not sure. Sorry? I'm not sure. No, no, not at all. I mean, I did eat a lot of pizza there, so oh, we knew each other. Maybe for a favour. Um, so then, sort of after, after Zwift was built, or the first version of Swift was built, um, basically what we did, we spent six months of development time, just full on development time, just going out there, we had no design, we had no marketing, no anything, we were just doing pure development, trying to create a product that could work for a restaurant and that could work for a restaurant's customer. Now, after you know having quite a bit of hospitality experience, um, the, the, the main people which are in, um, in, in business, in hospitality, they're fantastic at making food. Fantastic at customer service, and fantastic at making sure that their restaurants are, are, are humming along. Um, and that's essentially it. So what I wanted was to create a product that didn't change any of that, that it complemented what they were doing. It wasn't something where they needed to sit through a training exercise afternoon or, um, or, or drastically change their internal procedures. So I wanted to create a system that where you'd look at it and it would work. Um, and it's as simple as that. So. Um, once we had that product built, we went out to Pedro's Pit and we said, hey, we've got a product, you know, I delivered some pizzas for you, how about we throw this product in, into your restaurant and, uh, and we give this a go. And they were more than happy to, happy to take it on board, which is great. And, uh, and at the same time, we started doing some focus group testing. Now, focus group testing was something which I was never a huge fan of, but I thought, let's get it out there. And before we start going sort of public with this idea, with this project, let's go out there and see what people think of it. And so over a series of uh, sort of three or four nights in the, um, in the Swift office there, we had around about 60 people come through and we set them up with a laptop each and we recorded absolutely everything. We recorded what the laptop's camera was recording, the room, um, 
uh, and then screen as well what they were actually doing on their screen. And we basically said to them, here's a website, pedrospit.com today, um, and here's an order. This is what we want you to order. We gave them no other instructions. This is for the first task. And just saw what they did, saw how they fumbled around, saw how they uh, basically went through and, and went to place the order. And the amount of feedback that we got from that was absolutely spectacular. The business, quite simply, would not have survived if we didn't have those nights. It was, it was wonderful. And it was a, a bit of a, an awakening for us. We realised that we were building a product for ourselves instead of for the masses. And especially after six months of, of pure development, we had the functionality done, down and we had it so it was working really, really well. Um, but we just didn't have it so that it was, it was completely usable. And that was a, a, a really big eye opener for us, which was fantastic. So basically the next week we had a, a designer on board who we still got on board today, who is absolutely spectacular. Um, and he, uh, he basically came and said, fantastic, you've got a really good product there, let's just make it look good, because it looks like ours at the moment. Um, and so we went out and we tried a couple of different designs, we did some more focus group testing, and then we, uh, then we had Pedro's Pit online. And uh, it was November the 6th in 2009 that we got our first online order, which wasn't from a staff member or somebody that, that knew the system or uh, my mum. And uh, she probably did order on that night, actually. Um, but yeah, that, that was a really special night for us and uh, for everyone that had been putting in all of the hard yards down at the, uh, the office there. Um, and then from then, it was just about, let's make this product as, as clean as we possibly can and design it so it can scale. At this point, we had one website, which was Pedro's Pit, and we had no model to how to turn that into hundreds of hundreds of restaurants across Australia, and so that hundreds of thousands of customers could use it. Um, so that was the next phase, essentially. So, so can I just ask a couple of questions here too? Yeah. In these focus groups that you had, and you had 60 people all playing through it, was there some of the learning came back that you were working on all types of development that wasn't necessary over here, this kind of stuff? Absolutely. Um, you know, a big part of what we, we do, and, and just to explain a little bit more about the, the product itself, we put equipment into the restaurants so that they can receive orders. When an order comes through, it makes a noise, the screen cake changes colour and they press one button. Uh, we also do a whole back end for the restaurant as well, so we call it the retailer portal, where they can get detailed statistical analytics, where they can get uh, Google Maps with pins of where all of their uh, customers are for their delivery zone, so they can see where they've got a lot of customers, where they don't. Uh, absolutely everything and we spent a lot of our development time on that as well um, now that was kind of like with the um, uh, with the focus group nights we realized that we were doing a lot of development for things which weren't really going to be used a hell of a lot and once we realized that we started to just focus on on the uh, on the 90 percenters and then are going from there so yeah with the with the focus group testings absolutely part of the uh, like the second task was to log in as an, as an existing customer and uh, go into your favourite orders and then place an order from that. Um, so part of that logging in was a, an entire customer membership portal which had, once again, stats and uh, a whole range of communication and review features and everything else. Um, and that just really wasn't utilised for, for a long, long time. And so I guess that a really big lesson for us there was obviously user interface is, is spectacularly important. Uh, it has to be really intuitive. If someone gets onto your website and they're like, uh, how do I anything? You know, you, you, you've got problems. Um, but we also realised where we should be focusing our development efforts. Now, developers, for any of you who have, who have got developers, uh, you know that they're, they're not cheap and, uh, and you know, you really have to, to utilise their time as, as valuably as you possibly can. I'll just turn my phone on so I don't know where I'm Sorry? Your focus group, where did you draw them from? Uh, some of the customers who were down at Pedro's Pit, basically when we were putting in the equipment, we, they were like, oh, what's it like? What's the website like? I'm like, hey, let's get you into the office and give it a go. Uh, and then that was how we decided to do the focus group testing. So then, once again, friends, family, um, investors, uh, some of the investors, that was, that was a really good um, insight for them to see how far their baby had come and, uh, and for them to be able to get some good, valuable feedback, um, you know, to, for them to be able to have a voice, which was good. Um, and yeah, once again, you know, it was just so incredibly invaluable. You know, sometimes uh, you, you just get so stuck on a, uh, on a certain thing or so you're concentrating so hard on a certain thing that you forget to sort of take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, you know, why are we really doing this? What's, what's the main core of this? Um, so those focus group testing, uh, testing nights that we did were spectacular.
And we, we've done them since then as well, a couple of times, just to make sure that the, the new products that we're doing, uh, when we launched the iPhone applications, the Android applications, once again, we did the uh, focus group testing for that. We got a lot of good valuable feedback, which is great. Um, so after uh, after having a product which was working, you yeah, had your first order, big order, jumping in here. Yeah, it was twenty four dollars. It was massive, <laughs> and uh, and we got our seven percent commission out of that. So that was good. That paid for six months worth of developers. Um, no, it was good. So you know we we had a model, and now we had something that we could sell to other restaurants. So we basically just went out there, hired a couple of sales staff, and uh, went out on the road and just started doing the hard slog. And uh, and I was hoping that. It would, uh, it would take off without the need of me going out there and going on the road and uh, that everything would just be hunky-dory, but it absolutely was not. Um, at the time, after probably 12 months or 18 months after the idea first originally spawned and we'd had Pedro's Pit online for about two months and we had a couple of sales guys, uh, this is around about the time where menu logs started to, to take off in terms of online ordering. Uh, and their model was completely different to, to what ours is, and, and it still is. And, uh, and we still believe that they kind of complement each other. Um, but the good thing is about menu log, um, actually I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, we had a really hard time when we were going out there on the road, or when the sales guys were going out there on the road, convincing restaurants that online ordering was going to be a benefit. Going to be a benefit for them, going to be a benefit for their customers as well. Now hospitality traditionally is basically the last industry to, to uptake on technology. Um, you know, they were the last industry to adopt credit cards back in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, it's an industry which loves cash. They love to be able to pay their staff in cash and keep separate books and do all of that dodgy stuff. Um, and so having a system where everything was accounted for and everything was going to be on the books and someone was going to be taking a, a fairly considerable commission from it as well. It was, it was quite a difficult road, especially when a lot of these restaurateurs were kind of 60 or 70 and had been in the, in the restaurant for 30 or 40 years. Before that, it was their, in the, you know, their parents and before that, their parents. And so, you know, having this new technology coming in and, and completely revolutionising their business, potentially opening the doors to new customers and everything else, was a bit of an intimidation for them. And um, then menu log, go back to menu log, we... Uh, then they came out and started doing online ordering. And their model was essentially, let's just get online orders and give them to the restaurants. So they'd call up the restaurant and say, hey, we've got an order for you. Here's the credit card number. Here's the order. This is what it is. So this worked fantastically for them just to, to get the ball rolling for them. But it also worked fantastically for us because they assisted us in educating an entire industry about online ordering and the benefits of online ordering. It's much easier to convince someone about something once they've seen the proof. Um, and you know we had the proof with Pedro's Pit, but we didn't have that that first person proof for them. So that was really good for us. And then all we had to do was just compare menu log with us. And yeah, I, I find always you know all the advances in technology and everything else that it always comes back to going out there and, and doing the, the you know the hard yards and and, yeah. and the hustle. I mean, it doesn't matter whose startup story you hear. Always like went out there. Knocked on doors, you know. Yeah, yeah, you had to do absolutely. It. For a good uh, eight to twelve months, I was I was out there, you know. I would do cold calling every <laughs> night, speak to restaurants, and sorry, uh, 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 speaking to restaurants and, and hearing a hundred no's, and then you get that little bite. It's just you know super exciting. Uh, and, and for those those salespeople which are out there, which can do it, do it year after year, absolutely hats off to them. You know, we've got a couple of really good crack hot sales guys at the office. And hats off to them because it is a, a tough, tough gig hearing so many no's before you hear a yes. Um, and so because I, I obviously committed so much time, effort, and money, and, and reputation, and everything, it was, it was a really big drive for me to, to get out there and to convince these restaurants that not only to buy a product off me, but that this product was going to be beneficial to their business as well. And so we did things like uh, free trials, no setup fees, reduced commissions, whatever we could just to get people on board for the first 10 or 20 restaurants. Um, and that, that was a really, really tough time, but you know, it, it's what you do in terms of uh, trying to get traction, trying to, trying to make uh, something that you believe in work. And I uh, very happy when I stopped going out on the road day sure. to day, you know, doing cold call sales and, and all of that. Yes. So, so um, having a competitor in the space, did that, did you see that actually help you or in terms of building a market for or, or understanding a product? Look, I, I don't think that, that we'd be where we are today without any of Absolutely, it, it helped us through and through. 
Um, we uh, were a little bit concerned initially because you know we started off and we had this idea for online ordering. We wanted to do this, and you know online ordering was happening across America when we when we started up. And there were a couple of big companies like uh, Papa John's Pizza, which had four thousand uh, stores with online ordering. So you know it wasn't a model, um, or it was a model which had been proven online ordering. Um, so having having competition. This just gave us an extra energy, an, an extra sort of fire in our belly, especially after 12, 18 months of development and out on the road and everything else. This was really good sort of enthusiasm and motivation for us. You know, we've got someone else in the industry, we've got someone else in the market that wants to be doing a similar thing to what we are. Let's just make sure that we're the best. Let's make sure that we're better in, in every angle, every aspect of what we're doing. So I really appreciate the, the competition. And going from menu loggers to competitors, we've now got 26 online ordering companies which are serving Victorian restaurants alone and they're all doing a really similar thing to, to Minilog and, and a lot of them are trying you know different things and uh, it's, a, it's a really crazy industry itself now online ordering for, for restaurants which is um, which is fantastic and I love it I love having that competition absolutely I was actually just out at the fine food thing was last week or yeah. before because we got an import business and there must have been three three stands like I said, it's yeah, a similar kind of thing, and I was just almost because I already knew I was interviewing you. I was like, but does it work on an Android and an iPhone? And I was like, no, nah, I didn't have it. So I was like, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, no, that's it. And uh, I mean, we were down there at the Fine Food Show as well. Oh. We didn't have a stall. I uh, didn't really believe in getting a stall, but we were all walking around in our Swift gear, and our cards, <laughs> cool. doing whatever networking we could, trying to find partners in the industry. Uh, you know, lots of point of sale companies down there, lots of uh, food servicing companies down there. That's great, and you know, a little bit of free food and a bit of fun. That's good. Did you have a question as well? Were you pretty good? Yeah, so uh, one part of what we do is online ordering. Um, well, in terms of that, yes, Menu Log is a competitor. In terms of the, the whole umbrella of what we do, absolutely, Menu Log is not. Uh, sometimes, no matter how much you're trying to explain that to a potential client, they still look at Menu Log and us and say, well, they're charging this, this is what you're charging. Um, so we can get into more of what Swift does in a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, you, you, you're out on the road, 18 months, busting your ass, you know, getting these clients on the books, and then you said, look, now I've got enough, you know, enough, what, steady income, or enough to, obviously, you, you could come back in the office and focus on, you know, customer experience and the rest of it. Yeah. So that's, that's where it. you were at, at that stage, yeah? Yeah, so... Um, once we, we had a really good sales team on board and we were starting to get some consistent sales, definitely wasn't as, as much as what the uh, projections were in terms of their financials, which I put together initially. And uh, it, it was definitely, definitely not as much. And you know, even lo a lot less than the worst case scenarios, which I put into the uh, projected financials. It was, it was a real struggle there for a long time. And uh, you know, once again, going back to startup grind, it, it was an absolute grind, and you really do just have to sort of dig deep and, and really just keep on pushing forward. If, it, if it's something that you believe in, then you know, absolutely just keep on pushing. You know, I had a lot of support as well during those tough times, obviously from, from the staff uh, who believed in the product as well, uh, who were taking pay cuts uh, volunteer, voluntarily, taking pay cuts just so that we could uh, uh, continue to, to move forward. I uh, had a lot of Tons of support from my parents, um, you know, just my old man and his old man, uh, entrepreneurs, and um, uh, you know, the feedback that I was getting from from them was spectacular. So that's that's uh, you know really something that you need. I consider my old man to be my mentor for sure. And uh, um, yes. I've got a question on the investors. Sure. Well, me, myself, I own 80% of the company, and then the other 20% are the investors. Yeah. And so that was a, it's, it's an interesting question actually, because when I, was, when I was building the model, I really wanted to make sure that, that I had full control of the company through and through. I didn't want to get to a point uh, in five years or 10 years where the company was uh, scaled according to the plans and, and everything was going really well, and then for the board to come in and say, you know, I want to do this, or I want to do that. Really wanted to make sure that it was going to be doing what I was wanting it to do the whole time. Um, and so, spent a lot of time and a lot of money working with solicitors trying to get a, a, a investment structure which could protect that, and uh, and then could also protect me in the future. So, 
but yeah, 80 20. That's it. Um, and that was that was also really hard to try and get investors on board when you know they're taking a, a cut of 20 percent and you know putting in a, a large amount of money. That was that was pretty tough, but you know they were believing the, the future of, of the product. Um, so yeah, going back to once we had the, the sales guys on board and we were doing all of that, we started to get some traction, and then we uh, I wouldn't say we hit a tipping point, but we, we started to get some momentum, and that momentum was fantastic. Fantastic for the vibe in the office. Fantastic for everything everyone was was working harder and everyone had a really good sort of feel for uh the future of the business and where we were going and um you know we had uh, a bunch of the, the the staff which had been there from the start they, they were throwing some of their own money in as uh, investors and they're absolutely loving it that they have now um and then we were just trying to scale so what we wanted to do was continue uh with our developers uh, we definitely didn't have a full size development team anymore because we had a product which was working, but we still had developers on board. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were constantly evolving and adapting to a rapidly changing industry, but we also wanted to make sure that our product was the easiest to use and the most beneficial for those that were using it. So the restaurants that are using it and also their customers. Um, so the software which we put into the restaurants, it's a spectacular piece of software and it runs absolutely seamlessly. We give them a control panel where they've got essentially four or five buttons. Big green one, when an order comes in, makes a sound, they press out and it prints out. So you, you do all the photogra photography as well? Yeah, right absolutely. So when we, uh, just to give you like an example, if if, uh, if you had a restaurant yep. and uh, we called it Chris's Pizza, this one. Um, basically we'd come up to you and you know, you've got a nice client, uh, clientele, you've got good loyalty, you've got uh, you might have a, an account with Menulog getting some orders through them or you know, I take away or any of those companies. Um, and then we come up to you and say, hey Chris, let's take your business, what you do, which is great for your customers besides the actual food. You know, you've got your nice interior, you've got a good customer service, you've got this style happening. Let's go and reflect that online. So we send down professional photographers, we send down marketers, designers, absolutely the, the whole nine yards to make sure that what we're creating is going to be what you want. And, and it's going to represent your business. And then uh, we go back and uh, we basically send you a few different drafts. So entire website mock-ups will do four or five different designs using our ideas, your ideas, um, traditional ideas, whatever it might be, which is making you you. We'll do that. And then we give you a lot of opportunity to have feedback in, in this process. And I say opportunity because a lot of these restaurants are like, just make it look awesome. We don't want to, you know, just make it look like me, like make it look awesome. But we like to have a lot of feedback for those restaurants that want to get board, on board so that, so that it really is a, a true reflection of their business and it's something that they can take pride in, something that they can you know, be proud of and, and boast about and talk to their customers about and their friends and family and staff and talk about. And, uh, and that's, that's really what we try and represent. So I'm, I'm, I'm this, the, the pizza shop and I've, I've decided, look, it's time. I need to get a website. I come over to you. Uh, I, I pay a little bit of, of money, I'm familiar because I've been talking to your stuff. Yep. Uh, uh, they get set up, but not only, they, so they set up the website, they take photos, so now everything looks professional um, on online, but then I also get the, you guys have already got out of the box, the Android works on the iPhone, works on the iPad, yep. everything. Absolutely. So the, the current version of the, uh, the app that we do, that would all be with your logos, your styles, your colors, absolutely everything which, you know, once again represents you. Um, and it's just a super quick, simple way to order with the iPhone and the Android apps and the iPad apps and things like that. Um, and uh, so yeah, and then we say, fantastic, you've got your website, uh, you've got your online ordering system, we put the equipment in your restaurant, we've told you how it all works, we've showed you everything. Instead of just saying, you know, good luck with it, we say, okay, now that we've set this up for you, we've now created a dynamic partnership, which we are gonna be bending over backwards to make sure that as much traffic as possible comes to your website and as much of that traffic is going to be placing orders with you. So this is either your existing customers or new potential customers that you might not know of. And uh, so this is where our marketing departments come in. And this is uh, one of the things which really differentiates Zwift from any of the other online ordering companies out there. We absolutely bend over backwards to make sure that you guys are making money. Now, at the end of the day, we take a, a small commission from each order which comes through the system. So it's in our best interest for you to be making a lot of money. Um, but we'll go down and, and part of that initial uh, setup, that initial promotion, we'll do things like thousands of flyers, we'll do window stickers, we'll do in-store displays, we'll do... There's big Facebook things that you Yeah, yeah, do. absolutely, They're, that's all us. Pretty much, you know, down at Baked in Elwood. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's, that's pretty much all us. 
Um, and tons of like traditional methods of, of, of promotion that a restaurant would do. Um, we'd, we'd redesign your menus for you, we'd print out new menus for you so that it's got your website on there. So the physical menus. The physical menus, yep. Um, and uh, basically we, we do whatever we can. Um, and then you've got the, the online side of things. We'll do Facebook pages, Facebook advertising, uh, Google AdWords, SEO, SEM. Like we, we go the whole nine yards. And then it really takes you from, uh, even if you were a skeptic of it, which, which a lot of people are when it's something which they haven't had experience in before, um, just making sure that you've got that initial uh, balloon of, of customers. Um, it's, it's just it's a really good system. It, it costs us a lot of money. We definitely don't cover our costs when we when we sign up a restaurant. Um, we just do it all for the for the long term with each which with each and every restaurant. Um, and then basically, yes, sorry. I just wanted to ask you for business model. That's what I'm hearing is more it's investment for you. Yeah. Into uh, into a business that don't have, you know I have a lot of turnover, but it's it's profit margins are pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she asked because we've got uh, really small profit margins, which which we definitely do. Um, how long will it take until we, we sort of break even, and start to make some uh, make some money? Now we, we take it on sort of an individual case by case scenario. So with Chris, uh, if he starts to get some good order numbers, we should hope to see have a break even within around about four months. Um, so there's a lot of risk in, in doing that because hospitality, it's a very transient industry. We've got a lot of restaurants that change hands or that go under or, um, you know, we're, we're relying on you continuing to, to pump out good pizza. Uh, at the end of the day, if you, if you start cutting costs and getting uh, poor quality ingredients and your customers start going elsewhere, there's not much that we can do about that. So it's definitely a risk and, and uh, because of that, we, we select our, our clients. We, we don't take everyone on board. We say no to a lot of people because we've got something where we want to be proud of every website that we've got and we want to be proud of our, our business and also not risking everything. Um, so we, we do, yeah, we do absolutely say no. And that's, that's pretty hard from a, uh, from a founder's point of view saying no to potential business. But, uh, but yeah, we, we definitely do. Uh, in terms of the, the business as a whole, uh, we, uh, uh, well, I mean, we, we started breaking even probably about 12 months ago. And uh, so that was, that was a lot later than expected. And uh, speak to anyone in the investors and they'll tell you. But um, yeah, no, so it, it's, it's, it's definitely a risk with this, with this certain model. But once we've got you on board, we make sure that a couple of things happen. We really want to be the first phone call that you make for anything that you do in your business. If you sit there and you're like, oh, I want to do some newspaper advertising and I want to promote in-store dining. Uh, instead of you know, calling up a newspaper, trying to find some designers, some printers, whatever it might be, you'll give us a call and you'll speak to someone in the marketing department and basically we'll help you out and we'll do whatever we can to make sure that your business is thriving and then that's, that's going to benefit us. So this, this works really well for us and, uh, and you came into our offices today, you probably heard the phones just going absolutely nuts and it's, it's fantastic because we, we are now really tied in with a lot of these restaurants for anything that they want to be doing, they call us. They say, you know, we want to do a loyalty program, what's worked in the past, what hasn't. And so now we're becoming this voice in the industry as well as providing, you know, websites and iPhone apps and things like that, which is definitely the core of what we're doing. But now we're, we're really locked in with the success of these businesses and creating these partnerships with these businesses, which is fantastic. Now, that's, that's obviously a lot of work involved for, for every restaurant. We're, we're experts in a lot of things that I didn't expect us to be experts in. Um, so much so that a lot of the marketing that we do and a lot of the marketing that we do for our, our restaurants um, has become a really large, you know, I'd say it's like the majority of our business now, the, the marketing side of things, to the point of we were even toying uh, with, with splitting the business into two different entities, one which was uh, Zwift uh, Online Ordering, Zwift Restaurant Marketing Solutions or Hospitality Marketing Solutions. Um, we didn't end up doing that just because we, we wanted to give it all under the one umbrella. But um, we, uh, yeah, we, we still do a ton of marketing for, for restaurants which aren't a part of the online ordering thing. So we'll get restaurants coming up to us saying, hey, um, we heard you guys get some really good printing rates or you've got some really good designers or you've got some really good marketing ideas. And so that works for us as well because then we get a foot in the door with those restaurants and we say, hey, by the way, let's do some uh, online ordering for you as well. It's a good position to be in. If, if restaurants are coming to you and saying, look, 
what else do you got for us? It's awesome. I mean, yeah. And it must be like, uh, so let's say I was a bit of a skeptic and then I put in the system and stuff. What's the kind of feedback when they go, oh, you know, look, it's fantastic and our customers love this, love this, you know, how, how, did, how did that work there? Yeah, look, that for me, that, that is my bread and butter, getting that feedback, getting those testimonials, getting that, uh, those restaurants that, that really are skeptical. And uh, there are a lot of them out there and they're like, all right, look, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go for six months, 12 months, see if it's gonna work. And if it doesn't, then, you know, consider this to be a waste and, yes. I was just gonna say, um, with what you're doing, you're purely focused on the events that are mentally working towards, or if you say someone like a cookie at Fruit Point, someone from Grill, grill can spoke to you. Um, yeah, yeah, look. the big franchises. The, the model is designed around independence. We have got a couple of franchises, uh, smaller franchises, sort of 15 to 20 stores across Australia type franchises where it works really well for them. Uh, for the larger ones, it's really hard to justify a commission. They sit there and they say, okay, well, let's de design our own online ordering system, which might cost half a million dollars. And then that way we don't have to pay a commission for the hundreds of thousands of orders we see getting every week. Uh, our model where we make our money is with commissions of orders. So. Um, Yes. Uh, so we uh, we're always open to it. Definitely, always open to being able to help them out. But uh, the larger the company, the more of it they take care of themselves. So yeah. So I uh, want to try and um, hear what you have, where you're at now, where you're going ahead in the future, and then I'll open up to the good questions there. So we've got uh, good, yeah, good film in there. But uh, yeah. So let's clock it over. Making money now. To, Broke even, and you know you, you're getting some people are coming to you now for good business. And, and, you know. Absolutely. So we, uh, we we've now got a bit of a name for ourselves within uh, the hospitality industry uh, for not just being premium online ordering solutions, not just providing uh, results with those online ordering solutions, but all everything. So all of the marketing and, and everything that we do. Um, people are just always shocked as to how much we will actually do for them. And when I say we bend over backwards for, for each and every restaurant, we really do. We, we go above and beyond. Um, so where we're at now, we've, uh, we, we've established ourselves and we're at a point where we're, we're scaling quite rapidly. Because we've only got offices at the moment in Melbourne, the majority of our restaurants are in Melbourne as well. We have got restaurants across every state, every state. Um, and we're opening up another office in Sydney at the start of next year which will be very exciting. It's going to be a sales base, technical base. And then uh, from there, we're going to go to New Zealand. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, we're going to be in New York within a couple of years. So right. as soon as we land in New York, I will just be absolutely ecstatic. So, you know, we're, we're always sort of keeping our eyes and ears open for, for new opportunities, things that we can do to, to make the business more better, <coughs> more efficient, uh, better for our clients, better for their customers as well. When we did the iPhone application, um, it was very funny because we spent the first 18 months of going out on the road selling to customers, selling to restaurants, that people don't want to use their phones to order. And then six months later, we're convincing them that they want to use their phones to order. They need to buy an iPhone app from us as well. So it's really interesting just how quickly the market changes. You know, five years ago, no one heard of, no one had heard of an iPhone. And then now, you know, I'd say 70% of you have probably got an iPhone. Some of you even an iPhone 5. Anyone? No? No iPhone? Please do not. No, me neither. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, we're, we're always trying to keep up, up with the trends and everything else. You know, we've, we've got um, some great ideas which are being worked on. We've always got different directions which we're concentrating in, things that we want to be doing, um, like doing point-of-sale systems, actually creating point-of-sale systems from the ground up, creating iPad apps, which are, are for, not just for the customers, but for the restaurants as well. Uh, elaborating on uh, our analytics that we utilize for, for the restaurants. As I was saying before, the analytics, they don't really get utilized a hell of a lot by the restaurants themselves. But what we found is that it wasn't a complete waste because now our marketing teams are utilizing the analytics from those restaurants and they're putting them into real world um, situations where they can say, okay, well, we haven't got customers over, over here, let's do some marketing over here. Or we've got a lot of customers which um, are ordering once a month, let's try to get them to order once a fortnight and sort of concentrate on, on different demographics. And so the marketers are really utilizing those analytics. And so that, for that reason alone, we're, we're concentrating a, a lot more on that and a lot more on how we can continue to make sure that the restaurants are really uh, engaging their customers, um, getting as much feedback from their customers as possible, uh, but then also just concentrating on user interface design, making sure that everything that we do is, is super easy to use so that my grandma can use it which she has.
cool. <laughs> it's also like all this learning too is going to be, uh, you, you know, you're going to be, make it easier to roll it out when you get to New Zealand at least. Like in even New York, I mean, it's almost then Australia becomes like has been a test market for you when you're talking in New York. I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like what I was saying before about the procedures. Uh, procedures, we, we, you know, everything that we do in, in the office is, is procedure based. And when I say that, it's not like you get out the procedure manual and say, what do we do in this situation, one, two, three. We, it, it's all automated. We designed a system called the Zwicketing system, which is our be all and end all project management, task allocation, uh, information system for our internal systems. Uh, so when a new restaurant signs up, depending on what plan they're on, depending on what uh, applications they've ordered or what design they're getting, um, up to about 240 different tasks get allocated to different people across the office automatically and it's all centralised so that we can all keep track of what each other are doing and you don't have to constantly be doing internal emails or yelling across the office finding out what everyone's doing. Everyone knows what they need to be doing, everyone knows the direction that that restaurant needs to be going in. Um, and so that, you know, I really love that going back to the email because it is turning the business itself into a, a turnkey franchise where we can open up in different places around the world and set up separate entities, um, even different investment structures, things like that, and be able to really take this from something which is uh, working really well in Melbourne and Australia to something that can work really well around the world. Is this the sales processes that, that you have also you started to talk yeah, about definitely. that? So, so yeah, definitely. So since day dot, we, uh, we set up a, an internal pipelining system uh, where all the research that we do, all the phone calls that we make, uh, all of the different steps along the, the pipeline are all completely documented with recommendations of what the sales guys should do and then also uh, what, what they've done and where, where that particular restaurant is. A lot of restaurants, you know, you go up to them, you sell them on an idea, they absolutely love it, the times are a little bit tough and they're like, you know, come back in a fortnight, come back in a month. And you go there and then the restaurant's closed down or, uh, you know, you come up to a place and they're like, oh look, uh, the, the owner's overseas or whatever else. And when you've got a sales guy who's dealing with hundreds of potential clients, it's really important that you've got a system that can keep up all of that information for you so that uh, he can approach someone two months after his last meeting and be on the same page, know who the key <laughs> staff are at the restaurant, know uh, what their last conversation was about, what their concerns were, were or um, whatever was holding them up from purchasing that first time and be able to just sort of pick straight back up. Um, so that and, and pretty much everything that we, we utilise within our offices uh, besides you know the Microsoft Office suite uh, has all been built from us from the ground up which is fantastic because it's completely customised to us, completely customised to what we do and how we do it, but it also means that we've got fine granular control of what we need to be changing if we need to change anything. So um, every time, like we've got a digital idea box as part of our intranets where staff will jump on and say, you know what we should do, let's, let's, let's try and do something like this. And it's fantastic. And at the end of every month we sit down and we work out the best ideas, which ones are going to be viable for us or our customers. And then we go out and we, we go and do them. So That's cool. it's, um, it's, it's fantastic. And it's a really exciting time to be a part of the business. You know, obviously I've been there since the start. And it's definitely had its ups and its downs where, you know, especially when I was out on the road doing sales, it was really, really tough trying to, trying to prove this product. But the feedback that you get from the customers, which absolutely love you, is just... It's it's worth more than gold, you know. Absolutely love it. Is there going to be? Is there coming to a point where you're going to need another capital injection to do these? Do you make these big moves that you're talking about, or uh, you're going to have to give up a bit of that eighty percent? Yeah, maybe. Um, it really depends on, on how we're, we're going to be scaling. At the moment, it's scaling quite organically, and I like that. It, it's a good feel, like it's it's naturally growing. Um, if we wanted to say, okay, let's go and take over New Zealand and open up a couple of offices across Australia and maybe hit New York or something like that, that's when we'd need to go in and pitch to VCs and try and get a big capital injection and go out and do this. And that's, um, that's not something that I'm prepared to do at the moment. You know, and, and you know, I might kick myself in five years for, for not doing it, but I still feel like uh, my heart for this business is, is letting it just grow naturally um, and, and pushing in the directions that we believe in, not where a board of investors believe. Um, now, in saying that, you know, we've got uh, one of the other online ordering companies out there, which some of you might be familiar with, called Delivery Hero. Uh, this is a, a fairly large company which has just received a $50 million um, backing from a, a pretty big VC. And so they're, they're coming into Australia and really trying to make some waves and trying to do this. Uh, there's a lot of money with um, uh, Just Eat, I think it might be, in the UK. Um, you know, there's Delivery.com in America, there's uh, Grubhub. Um, across Europe, all of these different online ordering companies getting huge, huge injections from these VCs. And 
it just doesn't feel like it's, it's a, uh, a natural thing. And uh, you know, I might be saying that because uh, I've never done it before or it's, it's too much of a risk or whatever, but I feel like I can get to, or the, the company itself can, can, can grow to something which is incredibly big quite quickly, but without compromising too, too many things. And, yeah, no, uh, I, I feel I, like that's the way to do it for me. Yeah, no, I, I, honestly, if, I, if you can kind of keep hold of my, if I could kind of keep hold of my own you know, money and my own stake in the business, why not? And if it's just a little bit slower in the path, then you know, so be it. You can always try, I don't think you're going to have any trouble trying to pitch some, to get some money down the track. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So we've always got the, the door uh, the, down the track could be open. So what happens with these guys, say from the US or whatever, you said, uh, what are they heroes? Delivery hero, yeah. So what are they going to, do they, t have you seen, they doing some like sneaky tactics come in trying to undercut you in terms of the, the percentage they take, uh, they get some share? Yeah, or? yeah, absolutely. Um, pretty much every other online ordering company out there is cheaper than us. Okay. Um, and our justification to restaurants is we've never tried to be a cheap online ordering system. We've tried to be the best, which provides the best results. We can't provide the results that we can unless we're taking a certain commission or charging a certain rate. It's just, it's not possible. Um, you know, unless you've got a $50 million injection sitting in there and back owner just chewing away at the money, but it's not a feasible uh, formula to be able to do that. So um, we, we get some of our clients who, who have been on with us and haven't tried the other online ordering companies, and then after six months, they're pretty happy with it. They're seeing a lot of orders come through, and they're seeing our fees kind of go up and up and up, not in terms of you know, we're charging them all, but just because more orders are coming through. Um, and they're seeing that as a, as a negative thing. So they'll go out and they'll try delivery hero or try menu log or I take away. And then six months later, come back to us and say, you know, orders have dropped off or you yeah, haven't been happy with the customer service or haven't been happy with this or our customers have gone off to um, our competition or whatever it might be. And so they come back to us and that, that's really, uh, that's good for the confidence as well. Yeah, and so, but look, I mean, everyone, anyone that's got a startup or small business always think about that. In being in that position where you know you talk about oh I get a chance on fifty million dollars here there must be some somewhat in the back of your mind sometime you're thinking oh, if I had an extra fifty million to play with I, I might do this and that what what would what would that uh, what would the picture look like in that scenario yeah definitely um, <laughs> try not to think about it too much but um, look definitely you, there, there are things that we could be doing there are there uh, are rates that we could be scaling which are much higher um, but you know once again I, I prefer to do it organically. And um, you know the way that I'm, I'm sort of structuring this business and trying to move forward, I don't want to be in Swift forever. And I've been really open with all of the investors and staff and, and uh, key retailers and things like that. I'm, I'm not going to be the Swift CEO forever, Swift founder, whatever. Um, I want to I want to build this company, make sure that it works, make sure that it's scaling, make sure that it's it's still viable and still relevant, and then go off and, and start something else. I really like the the challenge of getting something off the ground, the challenge and the heartache and uh, you know, doing something and then making it work and, and having your name be printed on it um, and then doing something else. Uh, you know, back when I had TechRelief, you know, I kind of got it working and it was a, it was a tiny business and then this, but got it working and then I kind of got a little bit bored with it. And so uh, I, I figure within five years, I'll probably start to get bored as with and, and move on to something else. But in saying that, you know, business will still be there and, uh, you know, someone else will take over probably one of the staff, which are, which is still there now from the start. Yep. Just, just a question. That was just a personal thing that you know. I, I find sometimes is like anyone knows me. I've got like a million ideas going on, and obviously you, you know you're pretty switched on entrepreneur. Is there any time where you just like had to say, no, I'm going to focus on just this. There's an opportunity over here, but I'm not going to take it because I've got to just work on Swift. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to say no uh, to to ideas. It's really hard to to not go in every direction and to just concentrate on one thing. Um, look, we, we've had plenty of ideas in the past which if we had the, the development time, the, the funding behind it, you know, could turn out to be really good products, really good features of what we're doing. Um, but we didn't and it's kind of been a good thing. So we, we've said no in the past for other reasons, whether they be financial or uh, whatever. But. Um, yeah, look, sometimes you can just be overwhelmed with ideas. We, we get, because we are the first port of call for a lot of these restaurants, they'll call us up and they'll say, hey, uh, wouldn't it be great if the iPhone app could do this? Or wouldn't it be great if the website could do this? And uh, let's, let's try and get this going or that going or, or whatever it might be. And then the staff, and you know, we're going out on the road trying to sell and they want uh, 
potential clients to have this or have that. Um, and that's all fantastic, and that's all really good feedback, which we all uh, take note of and, and you know consider the viability of it and work it out for the future. Um, however, you have to sort of sometimes step back and say, okay, well, this is what we're doing. This is what we're concentrating on. And this, this is our core business. Yeah, absolutely. This is our core business. And sometimes you, you've got to concentrate on, on your core. And, you know, for Zwift, it's online ordering, it's websites, it's uh, marketing services and comprehensive online solutions. So it's really important that we, we keep on going down that path. Now, in saying that, anything could happen in the future. Uh, you know, in five years' time, there might not even be a market for online ordering for, uh, for restaurants on iPhones or on computers because we've got you know, the iPhone 8, which has got holographic technology or whatever, and we'll have to catch up and do that, or um, who knows what it will be. So um, as, long as, as long as you're not sort of uh, keeping the blinkers on too much, uh, I think uh, you, know, you, you can concentrate on doing, on doing the right thing, but still being open to pivoting and being able to evolve and adapt. Yeah, still, still have that entrepreneurial spirit, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, look, I think it's a good point. I want to, just, if you don't mind, just wrap it up so I can open it up to some questions here. So I want to sure. just, first of all, um, got you a little gift. I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming along. So just be a well, welcome. Uh, this is so wrong. Uh, thank you. That's from, that's from us. Much appreciated. Uh, and but, uh, and uh, everyone, just thank you very much. This is for Brent for coming. And, uh, So uh, yeah, I just wanted to open it up to you guys and so you can pick Brent's brain and tell me about your restaurant if you go on order. No. No. So the original plan with the investors was uh, to pay them back over five years starting three years in. And uh, yeah, it was, it was something like that. They had a couple of different options. Uh, so that got pushed back a little bit and so now uh, we're at the point where we are doing uh, distributions. So definitely hasn't all been paid back, but the good thing is because of the investment structure, um, without going into to too much of it, uh, you know, they've got a valuable asset in terms of their actual investment itself, but they're also getting income from it. That is definitely the, uh, the first course of, uh, of, of what I'm trying to do. Um, and I was open once again to all of the investors that's actually part of the investor agreements. Uh, that if they want to be selling up their, their units or their shares, uh, that the first option is, is to me. Uh, that's definitely what I want to be doing. However, it's, uh, it's unlikely that I'll, I'll probably get any of those shares back. Yes? Um, right now, I'm not quite spending my advertising in online marketing to uh, traditional marketing. What's a rough part for <laughs> Look, it, it really... Is really depends on the, on the restaurant. Um, you know, we don't have just one sort of pigeonhole product, you take it off the shelf and you give that to a restaurant. It really depends on the restaurant, what they've been doing in the past, what's been working for their demographics, um, and then we kind of work out what's going to be working for them in terms of a combination of online and offline. Uh, now, in saying that, offline is definitely more expensive. Uh, online is uh, more effective, I'd say. But, you know, you can go out and you can do a letterbox drop of 30,000 in the area and not really be able to tell what kind of a, a return you've had on that investment. However, you can do something online, you do a voucher code, you do something which is traceable, trackable, um, and then you can really come back and say, okay, well, we got a 2% return on that. That was fantastic. Or 10% or 100 or whatever it might be. Or more than 100 when people are passing vouchers on to their friends. And that's, that's perfect. That's what you want to, see, to go viral. That, that kind of thing doesn't happen too much in, in the traditional marketing sense. You know, you don't get a, a pizza menu in your letterbox and then go, hey, how cool is this? Here, check this out. Yeah, photo, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. fax it to um, So, it, yeah, look, it really depends, but we, we kind of split it down the middle. You can ask for online marketing. Yes. Is it mainly the pay to the or is it the payments? Um, a lot of what we do initially is SEM. So we'll, we'll do a lot of paid advertisements, uh, Google AdWords, Facebook AdWords. And this will build up some initial traffic um, as the internet is finding out about a new website. Uh, and then we, we rely on SEO a lot. So we, we uh, make sure that a lot of the content, which is within a lot of the restaurants, is, is up to date, is, is fresh, is relevant, um, and uh, you know not too keyword strong. You know you do everything that you. you do it from an SEO point of view, and that tends to, to keep that momentum going. Every now and then we will do another injection of, of online adverts for a, uh, for a restaurant. If, if sales start to plateau a little bit, then uh, yeah, we'll definitely jump on board and give them another injection. 
but I'm a good combination of both. Is geo-targeting? No, not for us. Um, you know, well, well I suppose it, it, in one sense, yes, it is extremely relevant, in another one, it's not. Uh, if we've got a restaurant like Back to Melbourne that you were familiar with, um, there's no point in, in advertising in Carlton. So, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go and do letterbox drops in Carlton for it, you only do it to, to your area. So, uh, with the online advertising, it's pretty hard to do things like that on, on Facebook, but with Google AdWords, absolutely, you know, we, we, we do that as, as specifically as we can. Uh, but then we make it so that even if people in Carlton are exposed to the ads, then they're not likely to click on it. So the ad wouldn't say, great pizza. It would say, great pizza in Elwood. And so if they're not in Elwood, then they would click on it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, once again, it really depends on, on the restaurant. Um, we, we're not sitting there at the moment trying to, trying to make uh, or trying to hold on to as much money as possible. We're there trying to make sure that each and every one of our restaurants is experiencing consistent growth and we're putting whatever money is required to do that. So this is, this is the dynamic partnership that I was talking about before with each of our restaurants. We don't sit there and say, fantastic, you know, you've got a, a system, congratulations, good luck with it. We really do work to make sure that, that each and every restaurant is experiencing growth uh, within reason. Um, and that, that tends to work out really well for us because uh, a lot of our internal marketing teams, um, you know, they, they, they live and breathe SEO and SEM and they, they absolutely love doing uh, anything which can be uh, traceable, trackable and, and to be able to see an instant result or a, a result over a certain amount of time. So we see a restaurant which is plateauing and then our marketing teams will jump on board and say, hey, let's try this, let's try this, let's leverage your existing customers and try and get them to give a voucher to a friend of theirs or uh, leverage off a, 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 an event, like grand finals coming up. So we're doing a lot of uh, campaigns with a lot of our restaurants for grand final. And um, yeah, it really, I, even if I could find it out, I don't think I, I would. It's, uh, it's not something that we say, okay, this is how much we're spending on marketing. It's, uh, you know, this is how much money we've got, let's, let's put in whatever we need to make them grow. Um, especially in the, these early phases of the business, we're still building our, our uh, reputation within the industry and we're, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of feedback from new customers or new restaurants because they've gone, well, you know, we, my friend or my cousin or my friend's friend or you know, this, this restaurant around the corner, uh, we're struggling and then you guys came on board and, and we've seen them really skyrocket. So that's working really well for us. So even if it's advertising that we're pumping into a particular restaurant, we still consider it to be promotions for ourselves and brand building for ourselves. It must also help that it is, like you said, Elwood, that you, you have that, you know, diameter, you know, diameter or whatever around Elwood that you have to you know, focus on. Yeah. Because otherwise it could be anywhere and my dollars would be astronomical. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it, it, I suppose it's an interesting point as well. Because we don't have the one site which uh, as a customer, you could go to Zwift and say, I feel like some pizza. Uh, we don't do that. That's, that's what all of the other online ordering companies, all the other companies do. Um, because of that, we don't have a single point that we can market to, to, to get customers on board. So we do have to spend more money in terms of marketing than the other online ordering companies out there do. But we figure that it's, it's so much more relevant that the likelihood of that marketing being effective is a lot higher. So that works for us as well. Sorry, this the link. Can I get the lady back there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, up, yeah. up the back. Okay. Uh, just now, um, you measured that it takes around 12 months to develop the product, is it 12 months? To develop? Yeah. Uh, when we first started up, yeah. to get that first uh, minimum viable product up, yeah. Yeah, it took around about 12 months. Uh, to, that, that included all of the, the focus group testing and everything. Yep. After about six months, we had a product that worked. Okay. Uh, just didn't look good. So I'm just curious, when you guys actually developed the first product, uh, what were you thinking? Is it, is it something that existing product, or is it just a modification, or is it a new product at all? It was brand new. We, we built it from the ground up. We started off with the first line of code and just kept on going, kept on coding. So you guys are sure you can actually build Deliver the product. We can actually manage to to make it work. Were, were we sure? Uh, no, we were just blinded with hope, uh, blinded with uh, uh, confidence, and, uh, and and I think that's what we needed. You know, we had something where it, it was a, a massive amount of work which was required, yeah, especially yeah. starting off with such a comprehensive product. Yeah. Ooh, finding out where to start. Yeah. You know, and and 
that was it was a little bit daunting in the first few weeks we you know started in that direction and started in that direction and uh, uh, it, it wasn't until probably two months in of full-time expensive development yeah. that we really had um, something taking form and something that, that was, was working across all developers and uh, uh, you know we, we changed our, our programming language a couple of times we changed uh, all of our uh, all of our internal databasing and everything a couple of times just until we could work out something that was going to be scalable and, uh, and it was lucky that we did that and lucky that we we invested that time initially to do it because it's still a model which is working today and so our, our database scaling web server scaling everything that we're doing we're doing it all in-house so we do all of our hosting absolutely everything in-house and uh and it's because of that initial formula which which is why it's, it's still still working yeah. um, for, for that spending right at that point in time how much would be the total spending when you first build a product before you even have one set of sale Ooh. Look, yeah, look, it might have been around the, uh, the $100,000, $150,000 mark. Uh, that's just a ballpark figure though because at the time, hundreds of things were, were going on at once and we're trying all of these different things and, you know, we're going out there, started hiring uh, designers and marketers and things like that. So it's really hard to say. Uh, but, yeah. Is there, is there a plan B? This one not uh, Well, this, one, this one's working. This one's working really well. I know, I know. Um, Uh, was there a plan B? Yeah. Uh, there wasn't. There wasn't, and that was that was a really big drive uh, for me as well. There was no no safety net to fall back on. Uh, if it didn't work, it was falling over. Oh, and so well, in terms of in terms of somebody that's looking to get started or whatever, perhaps the best way to answer this okay. is like um, your interpretation of what an MVP is, so, or I minimum mean, viable product, and that's probably a good start for anyone. That's yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, if, if I was to go back and have my time again with Swift with the same amount of money, uh, that's probably the best way that I could reference it. Probably could have done it for a quarter of the cost and just really concentrated on that minimum viable product, making sure that what you're doing is, is what you want it to be, and, and concentrating on that, getting that up and running, getting some traction initially, and then once you've got some customers on board, once you've got some uh, some momentum, then continue with the investment on the development. We went really, really developer heavy initially, um, and that chewed up a lot of money. Uh, it really did. And so, um, yeah, I, I think uh, if, if you were going to be doing that again, minimum viable products all the way. So what we're saying is, if if you can sometimes some, forget about all the features and all the things, bells and whistles that you want. You can try and build something that's just going to solve the problem for the for the, for the customer, or you know, uh, to, um, prove that your you know the concept that you want to put to market works. That's all you need to build, and it can be look, look ugly or whatever. As long as it, as long as it proves that you know there's a customer and they want to play with this thing. It's fulfilling then, a need. Yeah, fulfilling a need. Yeah. I think there's a caveat to that too. Sorry. Now, Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. But I, I believe that say ten years ago that probably was the case, but now with the online. The way that online is, if you do deliver the bare minimum and it's ugly, people will go there and they'll never come back. Sure, sure. So, oh, no, I'm, I'm a big believer in design is everything. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's clever ways that you don't have to, you know, you don't even have to do any development, you know, to, to create a minimal viable product. It could be just the reaction you get on a splash page or whatever. I was just trying to illustrate to the lady that, you know, no, you don't have to have 250 grand in the bank to, to and get absolutely. started. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, when, when we started up as well, uh, cloud computing wasn't a, a, a massive thing, you know, it was, it was coming on board. Uh, so that's why we built everything in-house. Uh, I built the servers myself and I, I built the networks myself and did it all internally. You know, once again, to go back and start Swift again today, cost a hell of a lot less, keep it all in the cloud, keep all the computing and the, the tech responsibilities in the cloud. Um, probably even outsource some development, outsource design, start uh, doing a lot of that and it would, it would cost a lot less and, and probably be a lot quicker. However, I'm, I'm really proud of, of the way that the company started up with that developer heady six months uh, because that is, that's a product now which we still utilise. A lot of that original code is, is still in play today. Yes? Do you have a limit to the amount of customers you can take on in the certain uh, like so they're not competing against each Yeah, interesting question. Uh, it's what a lot of uh, our potential retailers bring up, they're like, okay, well, uh, you've got one of our competitors just around the corner, how do we know that you're going to be concentrating on me as much as you're going to be concentrating on them? 
like they've called us up because they've seen the effectiveness of it, they've seen their competition's order numbers rise and uh, maybe even their order numbers drop. Um, and so this is, this is really where our model works really well. If we had a, a system, a third party system where we were driving customers to us and then directing them to, to restaurants, that would be a problem. But because we're creating independent systems, independent domains, independent websites, independent uh, entire entities essentially, um, it's really, they, they don't cross over. So we will still sit there and say, we're going to do the best work that we can possibly do for you, considering what your business is, what you do, who your customers are. Um, yeah, we're still going to be doing that for your competition. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be hindered by, uh, by, uh, so by them and, and the work that we do for them. You would take on, say, two, two or three pizza places in one. Absolutely. We, we've got, we've got uh, streets where we've got 10 restaurants in uh, you know, 100 metres. And, and we will still be bending over backwards for each of them individually. And we always tell our, our clients, the more that we can do for you, the better. The more that you pick up the phone, the more that you're going to get from us. The more that you email us and the more that you uh, give us feedback about what your customers want, what's happening, um, then that, that's really where you're going to be benefiting. So the way that we see it is, we just uh, enhance any restaurant. So whatever they're doing, we make it that little bit better. Uh, at the end of the day, you've got a better pizza, a better customer service than your competition, you're going to do better. It's, uh, it's as simple as that, especially with hospitality. It's a really easy formula to make hospitality work. It's really hard to execute that formula. Good. And that's, sorry? Um, yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah, look, uh, back when I had the bar, it was really tough. You know, seven days a week, uh, morning, noon, and night. Basically, the only way that I could socialize was over the bar. Uh, my friends, my family uh, would come in and I'd see them at the bar. It was. Uh, that probably wasn't the best gift. Uh, Hello, perfect. perfect. <laughs> um, so, look, it is really important to be able to, to have that work life balance. Um, I, I definitely am not balanced in that regard. Uh, I, I get lectures from my old man about it. He's saying, you know, there's four things that you need to keep balanced in your life. You've got your spirituality, your physical, your mental, and your social. It's really important to keep those four things going. And, uh, and I definitely don't. Uh, my, my work for me is, is my passion. It's what I absolutely love doing. And um, I wake up in the mornings super early, and the, the first thing that's on my mind is work. I go to bed, and the last thing that, you know, turning off the iPad at the end of the night, and it's, it's, you know, I've been on the instrument, how have the orders been tonight, everything else. I live and breathe this company, I absolutely love it. In saying that, I can, I can switch off. Um, you know, I, I can, I love getting away, I love going overseas, love traveling, um, love New York, get to New York as often as I possibly can. Um, and it, it is really important to be able to switch off. It's, it's just sometimes really difficult to, especially when it's, it's your baby. Um, you know, when I first got here tonight, I was like, I've just got to go and make a couple of phone calls. It's just, it's, uh, it's as much as you want it to be, and I want it to be a lot. It's, uh, it, it feels good for me, so I enjoy that. Um, it is hard sometimes. Uh, my ex-girlfriend would definitely tell you how much it is hard. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to find time for, for relationships and hard to find time uh, to consistently be there for, for loved ones. But, um, you know, I think if, as long as you're aware of it, then you can make it work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Pretty much all of my friends are working for other people, and they they're shocked that I'll, I'll be in the office at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock on a Friday night, and they're they're down at the pub. Um, now, definitely, you know, still get my fair share of, of pub time in, but it's um it is it's hard for some people to understand why you're there. They're like, well, you know, you're the boss. Take the day off. You know, take a Monday off. Take a Friday off. Which you definitely can, but it's it's not about being able to do that. It's about wanting to be there. Um, you know, when, when it's, it's something that you love so much, it's, it's not like work, it's, it's play. Well, that's it. I mean, you, the, the opposite end of the spectrum is these people that can't stand their job and they're like dreading going to work all morning. You know, so yeah. It's better, you don't want to be in that position. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. I couldn't imagine it. It's the worst I think you have Yes? At the beginning, like the first step you made in marketing, 
See, once again, sort of rewinding to, to when we were first putting that first product out there and we had Pedro's Pit online. Um, it, was, uh, it was an industry that didn't know about online. And so I think in hindsight, we probably would have gone out and built something similar to, to what Menulog was doing where we wouldn't need to have that relationship with the restaurant and just bring them orders, bring them money from the internet. And it'd be as simple as that and maybe even do that for a couple of places and then get your foot in the door with them, get a relationship built with them, and then go down the road of, of the full online ordering system. Uh, that, in hindsight, would probably be something which would have been beneficial if I could go back in time to myself four years ago, that's definitely what I would be saying. Um, but, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question though. Um, I don't know if I've got a, a, a good enough answer for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? A bit easier? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sorry. <laughs> so, how did you find people to work with you? How was building your team? Yeah, uh, we, we chewed through a lot of staff initially. A lot of staff. Uh, I really wanted to find people which uh, were passionate about working for a startup. And in Melbourne, you know, there's, there's not a huge, well, back four or five years ago, there wasn't a really big startup scene. Uh, a lot of developers that would get in had been working for big companies. Uh, all of the designers from big advertising agencies and um, all of the marketers from big corporations as well. Um, really, uh, really hard to hold on to, to the right type of, of staff, get the right type of staff first of all and then hold on to them. But we chewed through them because not only did we want to find someone that was appropriate for the role, but someone that the role was really appropriate for them. I figure I can't work for someone that I'm not passionate about or that I don't believe in or that I don't understand. Uh, or don't understand the direction or whatever. Uh, and so I wanted to hire like-minded people. I wanted to hire people that could sit there and, and do the hard yards day after day after day because they've got a belief in what they're doing is what they want to be doing and a belief in the product as well. And so, uh, especially with developers, I think we went through about 14 or 15 different developers before we had our first team of five. And, uh, and that was you know, over, over weeks and weeks and weeks, and this is all you know, costing money, and we're trying to get the ball rolling and, and everything else. But I'm really glad that we were, we were really picky, and we still are. You know, every, every person that we get in, we essentially say, look, we, we want you to be a part of our family. And you're not going to be a part of the family if you don't believe what the family is about. Um, if, you, if you don't have a, a passion for it, you might be the best developer in the world, the best designer in the world, but if you don't like the product or, or the environment which that product is, is thriving in, then you know this isn't the place for you. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, especially as a startup, you don't have the, the big bucks which a lot of the, the big companies out there can afford to pay. Um, and it's important to find people that are passionate about the product, so that you know it's not just about the money. It's not just about getting here, checking in, and uh, going and doing your, your eight hours a day, and then you know clocking out and forgetting about it. Uh, you know, the amount of emails that go around in our office is just as much at, at 9 o'clock at night as what it is at lunchtime, and, uh, and that's fantastic. Yes. So, are you, are you paying them in equity, or I can't imagine trying to grind going very far. Yeah, look, it really didn't go very far. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we paid a lot of them with, uh, with just normal, pretty low wages, um, with the belief in it. A lot of those initial staff uh, and our investors, where we were putting in a certain amount of what would have been their wage into, into shares. Um, and we did that for, for months and months and months. And now those staff, those initial staff, um, not only are they in, you know, emotionally in contact with the business itself because of all of the work that they've done and, and been there since the start as it's been growing, uh, but they're also tied into the financial success of the business as well, which is fantastic because they can see there, maybe from a marketing point of view, go out and put something out there and, uh, and see the results of it, and see the, the, the company making more money and knowing that they're going to get a cut of that eventually, which is fantastic. Yes. Do you ever consider partnering with a co-founder in the beginning, or is that not an option? Or uh, it wasn't an option. It wasn't an option for me. I, um, you know, I had this, this vision, this drive, this passion, and I think that if I was to partner up with someone, um, to try and find someone that was as, uh, as crazy as I am, to, to believe in the same things that I do, would just be... Uh, uh, you know, a five-year exercise in itself. So and I wanted to go out there, I wanted to do it myself, and that way I could, you know, steer the company where I believe the company was going to be going or where, where it should be going. 
Um, so no, definitely, definitely don't want a co-founder. And I'd say that uh, you know a future business which I, I, I might start, um, I'd, I'd definitely be open to it. But with this particular one and the person that I was at the time, definitely not. I will just let over just a couple more uh, sure. friends. I'll leave you in back here. Um, you said you try a few different platforms and sort of change programming languages. Um, which ones did you try? Which ones did you end up using and why were they the best for your company? Okay, so uh, first off, we started off with uh, .NET. Uh, .NET was fantastic. Actually, we still use a lot, a lot of .NET. .NET was great because it was a language which I understood. Uh, I was a Visual Basic programmer back uh, way back in the day, VB6 and uh, even before that with Basic. Um, and so it was something that I knew and something that I understood. So that was the direction that I wanted to go in because then I could sit there with the development team and understand what they were doing. Um, however, .NET developers are, are pretty expensive developers. Uh, you know, if you go out there and you've got your, your PHP developers, there's a really big community, there's a really big uh, sort of open source community, easy to get freelancers, easy to get a lot of people in, a lot of university students which uh, want to get some experience, whatever, you can get that. But with .NET, it was uh, a lot more expensive, it's, it's sort of more the corporate style of programming language. Um, so we went from, from .NET to PHP, which was a natural progression, and then we actually went back to .NET. So we, we've still got some PHP in there. However, I, I found that it was a little bit too, uh, people might cringe at this, but it was almost like a bit of a hippie, uh, open vibe with PHP. There wasn't much uh, structure. And I really, really liked the structure of, of .NET. Um, and then we became a, a Microsoft BizSpark partner, and so we got three years worth of free software. This is absolutely spectacular for anyone wanting to cut costs on their software. Join up with Microsoft BizSpark or Microsoft Partnership Network. It's fantastic. All of our server software, all of our internal workstations, everything uh, running on Windows, running on, on, uh, on the BizSpark program is spectacular. So our, our development environments all, all came from that as well. So back to .NET, and, uh, uh, we basically run C Sharp, we've got uh, SQL servers and, uh, and everything else in between, uh, we've developed ourselves. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, my, my question was actually more of a response to the marketing question. Was okay. Uh, so you yeah. have to throw it back to No, no, no. Uh, Look, I, I'd, I'd like to be able to answer it. So maybe if it's, it's phrased in a different way, it, it might work for me. Um, Mick Levitz is from Polonized uh, uh, Robinson, and talks a lot about focus. So he says, you know, keep the scope wide in terms of who you want to look at. But when you go for an initial market, focus down and go for one specific, you know, the, the pizza shops in one suburb and really drill down. Did you do much along the lines of targeting down specific demographics? Yeah. And if you didn't, would you do it in the future? Yeah, look, we, we absolutely did. And, and you basically hit the nail on the head with it. We went and built a product which was going to be the most, well, for which the product was going to be the most effective. And that was pizza shops. And so we wanted pizza shops which were within 10 minutes of us. And that, that was our basic... That was our target market initially. Within 10 minutes, because we could get out there quickly if there was a technical problem, and it was it was really accessible for us from a sales point of view as well. Uh, pizza was fantastic. Everyone loves ordering pizza. There's 7,500 independent pizza shops across Australia. It was more than enough as a, of a saturation just for that one particular niche with cuisine within that uh, that market. And that was absolutely the direct, the direction that we pushed it forward down. Uh, now, in saying that, there's also a uh, a stereotype which uh, is, is fairly true for the pizza industry specifically, which are, uh, you know, like I was saying before, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, technophobes, uh, they love the cash, they, um, you know, it's a, a bit of a demographic there which was resistant to the product. Um, so that's when we started spreading off, like we'd be out there pitching pizza restaurants and the Thai restaurant next door would catch wind of it and be like, oh, that could work for us. And so, okay, we'll see you in half an hour, we'll come in. Um, so then, Absolutely, being, being specific for keeping your, your doors open to, to everything else. Absolutely. All right, uh, I'd like to just say a uh, big thank you again to Brent. Uh, thank you everyone for coming as well. Uh, Startup Brian's going to be here for some time now and we're going to run with his format. Uh, got the guys from Zero next month. I'm not sure if you're familiar with brilliant accounting software. Um, and, um, and, the, and actually another uh, business within that got purchased by Zero called PayCycle, um, and he's going to go through the whole process of how it was acquired and all that kind of stuff. And that's coming down the track, but um, yeah. And the beautiful part of being part of Startup Grind is if anyone comes in, big name comes out from the US or whatever that has an affiliation with us, we're able to you know put them on the spot, and um, yeah, so we can draw them with questions as well. 
But thank you very much, Brent, for coming. Yeah, you're very yeah. welcome. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it was insightful. I hope it was uh, slightly entertaining. And if you've got any questions and uh, want to come up and uh, speak to me afterwards, and I'll be sticking around for a little bit. So feel free to. Thank you very much. Man.